What's up? So, I said I wasn't going to be doing a lot of videos, and I'm not going to be doing a lot of videos, but I, um, it's a story behind why I'm going to do some videos and the progression of my life. I can't really talk about it right now. It's unfortunate that I just, there's, there's, a, there's a motive to the madness, and I can't get into it, but um, I wanted to create a series about my life that kind of takes it back to the beginning um, starting with my childhood and it kind of works my way up through, um, you know, all the way till I go to prison and, um, and, and even some prison stories, but, um, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a progression to that and it's, and it's, it's not, uh, I don't, I can't, I can't say why, but it's important that I get my story out there and, and talk about it. And some of it is to aggregate bits and pieces of it. Some of it's to inspire me in my writing. Um, and some of it's obviously to entertain you. So I figure I'm going to do like one video a week, maybe. And, um, and just kind of go through this progression. I, now, I had done this before and I have all these videos um, stored from like uh, when I, I put them on YouTube. I did the same thing, basically, on YouTube. Um, but the the sound quality was pretty bad, and and, uh, was, and the production quality was pretty bad. And I'm just gonna start over, and I'll, I'll tell a, a lot of the same stories, obviously. But I'm I'm not after the audience that I had. No offense, if you're if you're a follower, a fan of mine, um, you know these stories. Some of them you'll probably know and go, oh, I remember him telling this story. And I can assure you, they're gonna be exactly the same as they were last time. Or the, anytime I tell them, because they are my life. Um, you know, it's it's funny when you get these people who are like, that ain't like well, I remember they like they tried to say that the timeline with Tony Jacaloni. I'm like, I don't even know what the f you're talking about. I was 20 years old. I got out of jail. Tony Jacaloni started making me, you know, do not even make me. He asked me to do some things. I did it, and that was it. Did it for maybe three years when I'm in, like, pretty good. Anyways, my life is my life. I, I, I'm not going to debate it or or, or um, argue about it. It is what it is. I'm going to tell my life as I remember it. Now, if I get a, a, a date wrong, you know, and you're, you're telling a story that's 30, 40 years old, I don't, I might not get the exact, I'm going to give you a rough time frame of when, about the age that I was, or when it was, or where it was, uh, I can't get exact with it, um, my memory's not that good, nobody can remember stuff like that, and I, John Elite does, but uh, not me, my memory's not that good, but I mean, so I'm just going to tell these stories about, um, you know, what led me to prison, and also, but before that, what led me into a life of crime. What were the factors that led me into a life of crime? Um, now I've shared them before, but I'll share them again. And I, I probably I won't I, I won't be able to tell all the stories. I'm not gonna because I could I could I have like 300 shows on YouTube that I did telling these stories, and I, and I'll recall some of them, you know. And I I I can't even remember them all, you know. what I'm saying and then if you hit a keyword or my wife says something, remember that time? I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. But, but that's it. And as I tell these stories, there's going to be more and more stories that pop up and I'll get on a tendril and I'll leave the main story and then come back to it. And I, I wish, you know, I got a lot of, I got a lot of, not a lot of friends, but a few friends that it's funny. I wish they could come on here and, 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 and tell people like, yeah, this was, this was Al back in the day. This is how he was. But the problem is they're not, they're not coming on YouTube to, to say, I used to hang around a gangster and, and, and for fact, I mean, and some of them didn't even know I was a gangster because a lot of my friends, like in high school and stuff, I was friends with them just in high school. Um, and then after high school, they went on to college or they went on to start businesses or work for their family business or, or whatever. What the hell was that? And, uh, and I progressed into a life of crime, dark world of life of crime. And I, you know, I sold drugs. I started using drugs. I was in trouble. So my normal friends went one way and I went, I'd see him around the hood. Be like, what's up, man? You know, hit him up. Bang. I stopped by at her work or whatever. So I stopped by her house. What's up? I want to smoke a joint. So, but they knew I was doing dirt. I mean, I remember this one time I was about 21 years old, right? So I've been out of high school a couple of years and, um, and I was living in Detroit. I had my own house in Detroit, and and that was not a good place to live. A lot of people, nobody wanted to live in Detroit. I lived there because I got a good deal in a house, and I thought if I have these big parties in the backyard, I can make a bunch of money and like live for free, which I did. So I'd have these big parties. My my house was a little white house on State Fair. Um, it didn't have a. Uh, this is a good story. I'm going to tell it. Seaside story. I uh, it didn't have a, a garage, so I, I had a Mustang and a crotch rocket and Ninja. 
And uh, so what I would do is have these big parties. You know, my friend would bring over a stereo system and like put it speakers in the window and he'd go inside and DJ it. And I'd, and I'd give him like a hundred bucks for the night. And I'd get a couple of kegs, you know, two, three kegs. You know, I could get them kegs like 45 bucks. And I put them back there and I paid these, uh, a couple of big mother effing steroided out mongers. You know what I'm saying? So you give me 50 bucks, you just work the door and be security, right? Older guys, you know, like 25, 30 years old. I'm, I'm only like 21. And then I just have a bash and i tell all the neighbors i'm sorry i'm gonna have a loud party but you know you're welcome to come over and drink for free uh, i only had one time when the guy lived behind me got really mad because his kid was trying to sleep and he came out with a gun and shot the gun bang shut up i'm like I'm like f you you know what you do shoot us and i felt bad he was a cop too i was cool with the guy too but he's just you know poor kid was screaming and crying because of us and um so living in the ghetto uh like i was saying at the time one more quick story. I don't want to forget the original story. One, of, the one where, um, anyways, I remember one time at that house. It's about it's in the morning, and I, and I get up and I'm like hungover. I just had a big bash the night before, and I can make like a thousand bucks a night after I pay everybody off. I make a thousand bucks. It's not bad, you know. If I had in the summer, I could have a party every week, you know. Um, but I had, to, you know, you can't do it every week or all the time because the neighbors go crazy and the freaking cops come and it was, it was always fighting and stuff. People getting shot and stabbed. It's Detroit, so. I remember one time, this is black dude walking down the street, right? And he's pushing his bike, pushing it. And he's, as he goes by my house, I'm in my living room. I had a plushed out house. Like, even though I had just this little white house in the hood, it wasn't the hood. Like, it was like 90% white on my, on my street. So it's still, it's, this is like the last vestige of like decent area of Detroit back in the, like in the early nineties. Uh, now it's, now it's all hood now, but back then it was still pretty nice. Um, and so this black dude's willing to thing along, his bike along, and he's looking at me, and I'm in the house, my house, like I said, my house was plushed out, my girlfriend hooked me up, like, my girl Ramona just freaking plushed it out, she bought me all this badass furniture, everything was black and brass, <laughs> back at the time where, in the time where that was cool, like, black and brass, everything, everything, it was black and brass, it was dope, man, my house is dope, and I was a slob too, she'd come over and do all my dishes, and it was, and I'm, I'm getting, I'm waking up and I'm hungover and I'm laying there on the couch and I see this dude wheeling his bike, man. He's looking in my backyard. I see him looking hard, man. So I freaking, like, I got a baseball bat behind the door. So I open the summertime. I said, yo, man, what are you looking at, man? I ain't looking at nothing, man. I look where I want to look. I said, nah, bro. Freaking, I didn't grab the bat. I walk outside. I said, man, you been looking at my backyard, mother effer. I know what you're doing, you crackhead mother effer. Man, who you think you're talking to, bro? He like drops his bike and starts walking towards me. Now, he, he just got, he just picked the fight with the wrong mother. Like, he just, he don't know me. <laughs> so, he, like, drops his bike. He goes, man, who are you talking to, man? Like, I'm some little punk-ass white boy. You know, I was probably, like, 200 pounds ripped up. So, I was I was doing bodybuilding shows. I just did some bodybuilding shows, like, a year before. So, I was, like, ripped up about 200, cut up. Pretty little Jersey Shore-looking mother. But I didn't look big. I probably had a t-shirt on. I probably didn't look like much. Just a white kid. He starts walking. Who you? And this dude's, like, 40-year-old crackhead. He says, man, who do you think you're talking to, man? I said, man. Don't be looking in my yard, mother I'll look where I want. He starts walking up on me. Bam! I just boss him. Bam! I crack him in the jaw. Boom. It, don't knock him, like, unconscious. But he goes down and, like, falls back. And he's looking at me. He goes, hey, what you do that for, man? I said, man, you were walking up on me. You don't think you were going to... I knew you were going to sucker punch me, mother After I knew what was coming. You think I'm stupid? Because I knew what he's going to do. He's going to get up on me. Man, what you think, man? Man, come on, man. You look where I want. Bam! He's going to freaking sucker punch me. Like, yeah, I got you, boy. Well, no, nah, man. I'm going to hit him first. Boom! Knocked him out. Well, like the next day, somebody shot out my neighbor's freaking window. Um, there's a kid named Brian Shuick who lived next door. That's a long story, too. He's kind of a douchebag. But um, our houses looked almost identical. And at like freaking three in the morning, I hear this loud boom and it, loud bro somebody drove by and they hit him with a buckshot from a shotgun and they aimed at the upstairs window and i don't know if it was like the black dude and his boys and they were trying to get my house because they thought that his house was my house or like he was in some beef he sold some weed and he was kind of a douchebag so maybe somebody was after him i don't know but i do remember it happened the very next day after i freaking punched that dude in the face but anyways it was about that time i was um some some girls got murdered. Two two girls from the neighborhood got murdered. Stacy Leclerc and Tammy Derishan. Two beautiful girls, and they were like two. Basically, they were my girlfriend's two best friends. My girlfriend Ramona, her two best friends. Like Tammy wasn't her best friend, but Stacy was. Um, but Tammy was very close with her. They were like best friends until like Ramona started to think that I was sleeping with Tammy, which Tammy led her to believe. 
but that she didn't, you know, and Tammy tried to get with me. She tried to get me to sleep with her. She called me and after she got in a fight with her boyfriend and told me to come over. She's thinking about me. And it's like two in the morning. I go over there. We're in the back. She goes, you can come in and spend the night. I'm like, your sister sleeps in the room with you. She's like, don't worry. She won't say nothing. She wants me to go in the bed with her, with her sister in the room. And I'm like, nah. And on top of that, the girl was my boy's, was my boy's girl. And I was more like feeling her out for him. I wanted to bang her. I am certainly did. She was hot. She was the hottest chick in the neighborhood by far. The hottest chick in the neighborhood by far. I don't even like blondes. She was, she was, she was a hot blonde girl, but I didn't care. I, I was like, I'm, I want to see what she wants. So I go over there and she comes on me. I'm like, no. So anyway, she gets murdered. This black dude kills her and the other dude. She started dating this black dude named Sean Harris. He had a song called Soulful Morning or Soul, Soulful Morning, Soulful Moaning. Or Soulful Morning. One of the two. It was a good song. It was a really good song. It was on the radio. It was a really good song. And uh, she like started dating him. But he turned out to be a crackhead. He was like stealing her money and going in her purse. And like, I don't know. He, he, like they, they ended up trying to. She tried to break up with him. And she went to his house to get her CDs and all this stuff. And he ended up shooting and murdering her and her friend who came with her. Killed them, killed them both. He's in prison for life. I wish that's the one guy I said in prison. If I see this mother effer in prison, I am throwing all my restraint and restrictions out. I don't care about parole. I don't care about none of that stuff. Uh, if I see this mother effer in prison, I'm bashing his head in. I'm not even going to say nothing. Now, I'm a sucker punch. I'm going to walk right up to him and just wham, 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 just beat his brains in until they come pull me off. And I'll take the assault charge, go to the hole, whatever, whatever. For her, for them. I was going to do it for them. But I never ran into him. But I ran into Harris's all the time. You hear, like, on the microphone, so, so Harris stepped to the desk. Harris stepped to the desk. And I was always watching. I go, okay, that's Harris. Then I kind of walk by their, their door and see their name, the name tag. It was never Sean Harris. Once, there was the dude, a dude I thought was him. And it wasn't. He was a nice dude. He used to steal stuff out of the kitchen for me. Anyways, so they get murdered. And... I go, um, th th I'm on a freaking straight renegade tip at this time, man. This is like the first time I started dabbling in drugs. So I, I did dabble in drug and get high on like for o over a 10 year period. I had like four relapses. I think this was the first one though. So this wasn't a relapse. I just started getting high. I started off with pain pills after I broke my knuckle and, um, and so yeah, that's what I was my first one. I broke my knuckle and then I ate pain pills for three, four months and started doing heroin. And this is about the time I started doing heroin. But nobody knew. I was I was still working out. I was in the gym. I was Buffalo Cell. I had my own house. I had a ninja, a Mustang, gold chain, badass clothes. I'm in the club every night. But nobody freaking knew nothing. But my money was dropping. And and, and and some people were starting to figure out, like, something ain't right with him. Like, you could see it. My friends would tell me years later, like, dude, you could see it in your eyes, man. You, you could see it in your eyes. Something wasn't right. You look crazy, man. You look like you was ready to kill people all the time. I didn't. I thought I was just being myself. Man, I had a cell phone, man. I just like when cell phones first came out. I remember I had the cell phone. It was an Oki. I put it in my girl's name. My bill was a thousand bucks a month. And then I wouldn't pay it. So she paid it. So what a douchebag. I still gave her some money. But, um, so I'm, this, these two girls get murdered. So there's a funeral. And I had, I had just got, I'll tell this story later what happened, but I had been hit in the head with a baseball bat and stabbed. Um, just like a couple of days before this. And the rumor was that I had been killed. You know how people talk, man. It's a bunch of bullshit. I think it was my boy Billy. Because I talked to my boy Billy after the fact. And he and he's the kind of guy who would just start a rumor. Start a rumor. It's like, yo, you hear about Al, man? They killed him in the hood, man. They killed him. They stabbed him up. And, and, and the next thing you know, everybody in the hood is just talking about it. Like, freaking Al got killed, man. Al, they killed Al, man. Freaking beat him in the head with a bat, stabbed him, blah, blah. So I don't know any of this. You know, a couple of days go by. These girls get murdered. I remember the day that I walk in. And my girlfriend knew I had a kind of a thing for that Tammy girl. I, I did have a thing for her. And that was cool of my girl. She respected it. She's like, I get it. You know, she's freaking, you know, beautiful girl. She's smart and talented. I understand. I don't like it. But um, I get it. And so I walked in that day. And she says, um, Tammy's been murdered. And St Stacy's missing. And, um, and they ended up finding Stacy the next day. And that's how they, they, they got the guy because she was still alive. The guy had rocked her on the field and shot her in the back of the head. Bullet went out through and came out of her mouth. She was still alive. And they found her 19 hours later. She was barely coherent. And she told the cops who did it. And then they got him. Um, coward. Because he, he put the other girl, Tammy, in the trunk of the car and burned it. 
Uh, what a coward, man. You killed two beautiful young girls, 19-year-old, beautiful 19-year-old girls. One was a homecoming queen. One was a prom queen, captain of the cheerleading team. Two hottest girls in the hood. He kills them both. This coward mother effer. But anyways, I remember pulling up at the funeral, like walking into the funeral, and everyone's looking at me. They're like, holy shit, dude, I thought you were dead. I'm like, what? He's like, we were dead. All these people started crowding around, talking to me like, man, I thought you were dead, bro. I got this big freaking, I'm all stitched up. Can you see, uh, right there is a scar, right there. If you look closely, there's a big scar. I got hit in the head with a bat a, a second time in another fight, and... And there's that scar too. But this is the, the one I had just got crushed with a bat. Dude broke a wood Louisville over my head. Broke the bat. And I'll tell that story. I've told that story before. And I'll tell it again down the road in the in the chronicle of my life. But I remember all these people are going, man, what the hell, man? You're freaking alive, bro. I'm, yeah, what do you mean? What's, and whatever. So going back to my childhood, this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to go back to my childhood and kind of start at the beginning, right? So, and then work my way up chronological. So you have a little bit, but I'll go off on tangents like that too. So I was, I don't remember a whole lot of my childhood, like three, four years old. When I was about four or five years old, my dad, I remember my first memories, my first memories in life was my dad beating my mom's ass with a broom. Uh, well, he'd slap her around, push her down into the bathtub and just put the water on. And he's whacking her with a broom. I'm screaming, trying to stop him. Daddy, daddy, daddy. He's pushing me away. He's all drunk, beating my mom's ass. She's screaming, ah, me and my sister are like trying to stop him. I took, I took the broom away from him. I remember one time and put it in my closet and then, and like, and then he comes and gets it, grabs the broom and goes back to whacking my mom with it. So they get divorced when I was like four. She doesn't tell her parents or brothers um, that's the thing. My grandfather grew up with the mafia. I'm not going to claim that he was a mafioso, but I will say this. He was a, a, a layoff bookie for like 40 years. And his cousin was the boss of the mafia for 40 years. Um, the mafia headquarters in ground zero in Detroit for that 40 year period was the Eastern market where it was almost exclusively Italian owned and all mobbed up. My grandfather had a business called Toco Produce in the Eastern market for 40 years. In 25 of those years, he had a multi-million dollar contract with the city of Detroit, delivering food for the schools, all the schools in Wayne County. Um, so anyways, he was, I can't articulate how close he was with these people, um, the mafia. They were his family, his cousins, his uncles, his you know, like that's his brothers. They all, all of them were involved. Um, I don't know what to what degree he was when he was younger because I wasn't alive. I was a kid, but um, by the time I kind of was in high school, he retired. You know, and, and um, but he still was around these people all the time. It was like imagine like I can't explain how tight the community is in a Sicilian uh, community, the Brogada. It's. All of these Sicilians had migrated from Terracini, Sicily, and landed in Detroit, and, mo and particularly Gross Point, um, Southern Gross Point, Michigan, which is borders on Detroit. They didn't come by accident there. There were several hundred of them. They all came there to be amongst the people that they knew, relatives, cousins, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews. Um, my grandfather originally came to uh, St. Louis, I believe, from Sicily. And then his father had gotten some kind of trouble and went back to Sicily and he went and lived with his his uncle, uh, in the, my great uncle in Detroit, in the Gross Point area. And then so many odd years later, my great grandfather moved back to Detroit and caught up with him. He married a woman in Sicily and brought her back. And I don't know if he clean, how he cleaned up the trouble that he was in. And I, you know, it's kind of a, a, a mystery to me. But um, so my grandfather uh, was around the same age as Jack Toko, the boss of the mob, and the, his brother Tony, and they lived uh, a couple blocks apart. And their their family, you know, his, his, my grandfather's their father was my grandma's uncle, and they were very very close. And all the same functions of church and and anniversary parties and weddings and funerals and baptisms, and they even built their own church, the Holy Family Church. Which is here's a, another funny irony. I remember Scott Bernstein saying. My favorite mafia book, I have it downstairs. He says, my favorite mafia book is not Motor City Mafia, his book. But he's like, in fact, it's the Holy Family Church book that your grandfather donated half the pictures to. That's what he said. Um, 
And so when you go through the book, you see all these pictures, you know, and they're compliments of my grandfather or grandparents. Um, so they were a close, tight niche community, um, these Sicilians. I can't tell you how tight they are. If, unless you're part of a, unless you've come from a tight uh, uh, ethnic community, like Arabic or, or um, actually, the Arabs are a lot like the same and the Greeks are like the same and the Italians are the same. They just they don't do well with outsiders. They don't want to do outsiders. What they do is they come to a place and start all these businesses, right? Enough businesses to where they can all do trade with themselves. And they don't have to really do a whole lot of outside stuff. If somebody needs a house built, they go over here and tell Pete Lito, my great grandpa. If somebody needs produce, they go to my grandpa Pete Toko. If somebody needs some clothing, the clothing, they go there. If somebody goes and needs a refrigerator fix, they go to this. They're all this community. So they, like in Black Bottom in Detroit, in the Gross Point area, I mean, in the um, Eastern Market area, there was, you know, I would say maybe a couple hundred businesses and they all owned it and they worked together to make the businesses thrive. Then they needed food. They didn't go to uh, just a, a waspy business owned by somebody who's not Sicilian from the community. No, they went to their own community. If they needed money from the bank, they went to their own community. They, they, everything was kind of encapsulated, hermetically sealed into this tight niche community, right? And so that's where I ended up going to live when my my parents got divorced. Uh, they, My mother never told my grandfather or her brothers that my father was beating her and abusing her because had he done that, he probably wouldn't be here. My, my, my father, even I've had this conversation with my father. Um, and I remember having it right in front of my wife a couple of years ago. And he said, he's like, you know, if, if your mother would have told you know, your uncles or your grandpa, which I was the way I was treating her, I probably wouldn't be here. I was like, no, no, you wouldn't. They would have killed you in a minute, man. And that would have been the end of it. They don't, they don't tolerate, uh, women abuse at all. They just don't. Get this light here. Ah, my dick's hanging out. You know, see that? Oh, uh, maybe the light is so in my eyes. It's a little better. So I go there to Gross Point. Now my, I, I after watching, witnessing my my father beat my mother uh, as a kid, and I don't really know much about anything. I don't know nothing about the mob or nothing like that. Um, and that's where it gets interesting with the mob thing because I'm, I'm i'm five years old right they put me in this school in trauma school uh i just told where, where, where was i telling this story well my, my like my third day of school at Trombley, which is this richie gross point neighborhood where I, I moved to in gross point with my grandparents it's it's a big money area a lot of money a lot of rich people in the area i was i wasn't uh like rich my grandparents weren't rich but they they had money they they had a lot of money like more money than average you know like, like they were I guess upper middle class. I think their house is worth four or five hundred grand right now. But again, it was only like three blocks from Detroit, so it made it kind of because it was a little bit close to the ghetto. Um, it didn't have the value as if you went up, you know, a mile up the road or two miles or three miles up the road. But um, and there was a lot of rich people in the neighborhood and all these rich kids in the school. And I ended up you know, I told the story about the bullies and I ended up beating the kid with a freaking uh, building block uh, like my third day of school. And uh, and I I started hanging around my cousins Frankie and Johnny. They were troublemakers. Um, they were they were just like me. They didn't have a father figure in their life. They were they, one was in prison. I don't know what the other father was, but their houses was a train wreck. Uh, you know, Johnny had like I don't even know how many sisters he had, he, he, and there was like seven of them. And they had this big, huge white house. And it was the only quad level house I'd ever been into. It was like an old house. It was four levels, and it was just like endless bedrooms and kids. And it was crazy. And he had no father. He acted a fool. He'd run around stealing, and and that's what he did. He stole and broke stuff. Was a vandalist, and he, anything, any kind of mischief, he wanted to get into it. And you know, a kid only lived two blocks away from me, and we were always, you know, together. So the thing is, all these old Italian men, I don't know their mob. I do remember when I was in kindergarten. Uh, I had a girlfriend named Jackie Reed. Well, she was my girlfriend, but I liked her. And her mother knew I liked her. And her mother knew my mother. And I remember saying, Jackie, why didn't you invite me to your party? And she says, "My mom, because my mom says you're in the mafia. I said, what the? I don't even know what the mafia is. I, 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 I don't even know. So I go to my Uncle Pete. I remember the day I asked him. He's sitting on a couch in the, in the family room. My sister's watching TV, cartoons or something. He's with his boy, 
I think it was his boy Artie. And I say, Uncle Pete, what's the mafia? He starts laughing. He kind of smiles. Like, what, what, why are you asking that? And he said, I said, Jackie says I'm in the mafia. What's the mafia? He's like, oh, don't worry. You'll find out soon enough. That's our family. And, I, and that's all he said. And I walked outside, went to my sandbox and played. But I, I started paying attention. I started paying attention more to how people treated my family and how people treated my grandfather and how people treated my mother and people treated me. And I noticed that when I went to the store, for example, there was a corner store uh, on Fairfax and an old Greek owner oh, name was Gus. And that guy found his way into my book. I, there's a scene in my book where, where uh, Vani saves King from getting murdered. And, uh, and it's just based on that, that store. Um, he walks in there and saves him. But the old man Gus, so I go walk up and, and buy candy, you know, and I always save up a little. I got money from all my aunts and uncles gave, gave me money for my birthday and Christmas and Easter. And so I always had money. Um, and some of my uncles just gave me money because they'd walk up to me, come here, Alonzo, and I stuff a freaking 20 in my pocket. I mean, you know how much money that is to a little freaking kid, five, four, five, six year old kid? I'm like, oh my God, thank you, Uncle Nicky. And uh, sometimes it was just five bucks, but it was a lot. So I go to buy a candy in the store, and Gus would you know, push my money back. So, no, no, Alonzo, top up, I said. Uh, and he'd always be like, no, no, let, let me tell you, I got something for mama. Hold on a second. He had a deli, and he'd go in the back, and he'd come back with like some veal cutlets or some steaks, and go, hey, here, bring this to your mama. And I said, okay, you know, we only lived freaking 10 houses away. So I'm like, all right, I'm walking down the alley. All I do is walk down the alley behind the store, and where it was. Because the store the, backed up to an alley. That alley went down to my, our house, like 10 houses down. Probably not even 10 houses. So I said, yeah, this is from Gus. But then I go out, you know, with my grandfather would babysit me, right? My grandparents. And he says, Alonzo, come on, we're going to the market. Or my Uncle Pete, too. This is all what I'm learning and seeing as a kid. And then we go down to Eastern Market. And keep in mind, it's like Little Italy in New York. Imagine Little Italy in New York. If you've ever seen it, that's what it looks like. But instead of restaurants, it's, it's more like wholesale um, food services where they sell produce, meats, deli stuff, whatever, butchers, butcher shops. Um, so my nose is itching. Uh, it always happens. So we go down there and everywhere we go, everybody's, hey, good body, Pete. And they shake his hand and they kiss him on the cheek and they say, hey, let me give you something to go in the back. And they give him a big box full of freaking fruit or, or meats or cheeses or what, bananas or whatever. And I'm not saying it's because my, my grandfather was a mob boss. I'm saying it was because that's how the community was. They liked my grandfather. He was well-known and well-liked. And I think my grandfather was someone who was important to Jack Toko and Tony Toko. He definitely was to Joe Toko. That was his brother. And because of that, he was the Toko. He was a, a well-known, well-liked character in the community. So people would always show him kind of respect that he deserved. I'm not saying he was a mob boss. Not saying it at all, but um, they treated him like he was one. So I'm a little kid. I'm watching this. I'm seeing this, and um, and I'm absorbing it. And this is how I end up writing my book to be a king. And this, the information that I'm telling you, it, it, it found its way into the world of this book. So if you read the book and you're wondering how I captured such a vivid, realistic world of the mafia, I'm telling you right now how I did it. It's not just made up. And anyone who listens to Matt Simoncini, the CEO of Lear Corporation, ranked 198 and Fortune 500, Fortune 200, told me, literally, he said, you're the greatest writer in the world that nobody knows about. I said, well, I'm working on that. And he says, uh, there's no possible way that anyone could ever write a book like this without intimate knowledge of that world, without being in that. I said, well, I had some, you know, enough to glean. He's like, yeah, I can see enough. And he, he loved the book. And he calls me every year and he says, where's volume three? Where's volume three? He's waiting for volume Everybody wants volume three. And, um, got me $14 million a year. I looked it up. He let me drive his Ferrari after he met me for lunch. He met me for lunch to tell me, shake my hand, say, you're the greatest writer in the world that nobody knows about. You need to get busy. And I said, oh, I'm working on that. And then we talked for about an hour over lunch and we walked out and he's got a Ferrari Marinello sitting there. I'm like, it's your Ferrari? He says, yeah. I said, oh, it's my bucket list to drive one of them. He goes, here's the keys, man. I was like, no way. I said, would you film this on Facebook Live for me? <laughs> I had to put Facebook Live, put it on Facebook Live, and I got loose on it too. And he said he'd never freaking broke the tires on it. And I'm like, I wasn't in it freaking thirty seconds. Boom! He looks all nervous. What's wrong, man? You never broke tires loose? He's like, No, not yet. I, I just got it. This car's only got three thousand miles. It's a like five hundred thousand dollar car. 
<laughs> it's because it's the collectors. It's the last of the uh, front engine gate shifted uh, Ferraris, the very last one. It's only got 3,000 miles on it, and I'm freaking ripping through the gears. But anyways, uh, that the, the, the harkens back to the authenticity of my book or my novels is um, because of that. Because when I was a kid, and this goes all the way up until, well, this this keeps going my whole life until I get locked up in prison. I see these characters and these people and the behaviors and how they act. That's how they. I was able to create these very realistic um, characters in the book based on characters that I saw or knew or was involved with or was around. Um, I don't need much. I mean, I could just see like my. I have these uncles that would come over, and that's again. You can't understand it about this tight niche community unless you're from a tight niche community. If you're from an Arab, Italian, Greek, something community, you understand how close everybody is. Everybody calls each other like every day. I mean, they're not, you know, your closest friends, but even your like the ones that are kind of acquainted, you know, not really your close, they call about once a week. And, you know, and there are people who might call once or twice a year, but I mean, the con the phone rings all day freaking long and people are coming and going all day long. And, and so I'm living there with my mom and my grandparents and every freaking old man that comes in, they go, Alonso, this is your uncle Tony. This is your uncle Pete. This is your uncle Jack. This is your uncle Joe. This, you know, and I'm a little kid. I'm like, hi, Uncle Joe. Hi, Uncle Tony. Hi, and like, eh, pet you on the head, and that's it. But as you get older, you watch them and their behavior, and you start to figure out who's who. Obviously, this guy's mobbed up because, you know, you can tell my grandfather treated all the old mob guys differently. He was extra nice. Like, he's, hey, come by. Oh, come on, sit down. My mom, make him something to eat. You know? And she's like, he like, no, 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 you're going to make me nothing. He's like, no, no, I'm just, make him, you like those cookies, right? Or she, and she's like, mom, make them cookies. And my grandma would make cookies. Like for Jack Togo. He did it for Jack Togo. He made these, or got the cookies. But, you know, she did for other people too. And they would, they would make him a meal. Right? He'd sit there at the kitchen table. And they would talk in Sicilian for an hour or two. And I'd watch them, I'd hear them, but you know, I'm not staring at them. I just, I like walk through the room, you know, I'm on my way to the living room or way to the basement to go play in the, ar in the arcade or, or sit and watch the TV in the next room. You'd hear them, you'd listen. And this is so regular for me that it's not like, so, so like, like the, the mob groupies, they go, oh, I can't even imagine all mob bosses and my mob guys in your house. Oh my God. I'm like, dude, listen, I would sit there and watch cartoons and wouldn't listen to, they, I didn't speak Sicilian. So I could barely understand what the frick they're talking about. They're in the kitchen just chattering away in Sicilian for frick two hours. Two, three old men. What the frick do I care? I don't, I don't, I don't, not paying attention to them. They might, before they leave, he might poke their head in and say, Alonzo, you'll be good. I said, yeah, all right. Sometimes they come in and slip a $20 bill on me. I'm like, like, man, hey, take this, Alonzo, for you. You know, be, you know, take out the garbage or something. I'm like, okay. This is normal for me my entire freaking life. Um, I don't know exactly who was who, but like, for example, I met Tony Giacalone when I was pretty young and I met my uncle Nicky when I was pretty young. And to be perfectly honest, I, I can't remember if it was my uncle Tony or uncle Nicky or both of them who taught me how to play poker when I was young. I, I have a distinct memory of my birthday party. Tony Giacalone and my uncle Nicky came into the house and I remember my grandfather saying, and my grand, my mother, excuse me, saying to them, like it's Alonzo's birthday, because he's kind of looking around, there's a bunch of little kids in there, and we're we're at the table doing playing a game or something. And uh, my mother says to him, you know, it's Alonzo's birthday today. And he goes, yeah. And they pull out them some money and they stuff. I remember, yeah, my uncle Nicky gives me like a fifty dollar bill. Like I never seen a fifty dollar bill. I'm like, what? Fifty dollar bill, and then I said, and I got it. I took it. I said, "What? I'm not worth the hundred? I was just joking. My freaking uncle slaps me. Uncle Pete slaps me in the head. Boom! What are you doing? You know, just disrespecting your uncle like that? I'm thinking, just joking. And he, afterwards, he pulled me aside. What are you doing? You don't freaking say something like that to one of these guys. You know what I'm saying? I said I was joking. So what? I was ten years old. And so they they sat us down and, and and taught us how to play poker. Me, my cousin Anthony, my cousin Pamela. I now Pamela wasn't there. She was too young. My cousin Brian, I think. He might have been too young, too. I don't know. There was a bunch of kids. And he said, sit down. I'm going to teach you how to play poker. And they gave us all. Each gave us 100 pennies. And they started teaching us the hands and what's the hands are there. And they spent like two, three hours with us, man. Like two, three freaking hours. These two old men are sitting there freaking 
divvying up poker and playing poker. One of them's kind of showing us the hands of the game. Who's what? He's walking around the table going, no, no, no. Put your card like this. Put that card there. Now, this is the hand. This is the full house. There's that. You walk over to the next one. No, no, no. Do this. This is this. This is the hand that beat, hand that beat that hand. Let me see your hand. Blah, blah. And they're teaching us. So, like, two hours go by, and uh, my, uh, Anthony wins all the pennies. It's all in you know, one winner. So, and he says, Tony says, you know, who's the big winner? And we're like, Anthony. And, and they're like, he's like, nah, look at the pennies in front of me. I never freaking played a hand. And I got freaking, you know, all this all this money. I mean, he, he was cutting every pot, you know. He was cutting like 10% out of every pot. So he's got a big freaking pot. He's like, don't, don't freaking, you got to be the house, he says. And only a sucker bets. That's what he said. Only a sucker bets. Don't be a sucker. Be the house. If you're going to gamble, you be the house. You got that? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I'm like, eh, no, no risk there. And so, I mean, when, I'm 10 years old. 10 years old think about that they came and they went every day all day long now i moved out of their house when i was like 11 and i'll tell you a little more and then i'll end it but when i was 11 uh my my i'm not really sure why my i love living with my grandparents i think i honestly think that it was too much for my grandparents having these two kids around me and my sister you know, they're old. They were retired. They took us to Disneyland and crap. That was a blast. You know, it was fun. Took the whole family to Disneyland. Um, but my grandparents deserved to be retired. Their son, Pete, my uncle, still lived there too. Now, he was only 12 years older than me. So he was only like 23 years old. You know, so that's not that weird, you know, that my uncle was still living at home. But he was a thug. My uncle was a freaking thug. He was a gangster. He was a coming up kind of half-ass wise guy he never wanted to be in the mob he never wanted to be a mobster he never wanted to be a he just was he just was around him all the kids that he grew up with that were his age jack toku's kids he had like nine of them and tony toku's kids and all these kids they didn't want to be in the mob they didn't want to be mobs the, their father's like you're not going to be in the mob you're going to be a doctor you're going to be a lawyer you're going to be this that Maybe one or two of them kind of moved into the family direction family business but not really well my uncle he knew them all. And he's like, they're not, they're freaking soft. They're, they're, they're going to college. They're college. They ain't doing this. Stuff. We're in the streets scamming and robbing drug dealers and freaking coming up with rackets and flipping stolen merch. And like, we had this scam where we were stealing all this uh, construction equipment and flipping it. And her, his, bat, her, his partner ended up back, uh, like backdooring him. So he had me beat him up. It's the first time I ever got paid to beat anybody up, my uncle, because he really wasn't that of a tough guy. So he's paid me 800 bucks to beat this guy's ass. And I, I beat the crap out of him too. Stomped him, man. And uh, I almost didn't because he had his dog with him when I did it. He came in with this freaking German Shepherd. And I told the owner to go over and tell him, get that dog out of here. You can't have it in. So he put it in the car and came back. And I freaking stomped his head in. Because he was back door, my uncle. My uncle and him were partners in stealing out, have a guy steal all this stuff and like brokering it to these construction companies. But he went around my uncle and went to the, one of these construction companies and said, here, I'll give it to you for less. You just cut him out and give me the money. Well, the, the guy, the construction company, went to my uncle and says, your boy's freaking back door on you, just so you know. And then he said, no, this ain't going to fly, man. He's like, Alonzo, I need you freaking beat. I said, how much? He says, I'll give you 800 bucks. I think he told me 500 at first. I'm like, nah, ain't enough. I'm like, I'll give you 800. I was like, eh, that's enough. <laughs> it's bad. But anyways, so my uncle, he's he's living in the house, and he's a really bad influence, right? Um, and I'll get into that. I'll, I'll tell you one or two more stories, and then I'll, I'll end it. But, um, you know, he he's hanging around drug. He gets busted selling coke uh, around that time, cocaine. and he's And he's using cocaine. And he's not a lot, you know, he's just like, like it was eighties, you know, so everybody was doing cocaine, but, um, but he was selling it and he got busted. And, uh, my grandparents were flipping out about it because they're really anti-drug, just flipping out about it. They wouldn't shut up, man, for like a year. In fact, he ended up moving out for a couple of years because he got sick of hearing them about it. They just, they harped on him all day, every day, just going on him. And they're saying it in Sicilian, but I know what the frick they're saying. And they, I hear cocaine in the in the thing, and plus, and, blah, 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 and they would go hard, and they spoke. They all spoke Sicilian. They didn't speak English, like they only spoke English to speak to me and my sister, to my mother and their kids. It was Sicilian all the time. The phone Sicilian, one hundred percent of the time Sicilian. Friends, family Sicilian. They might break into English in the middle of it just by accident, and then go back to Sicilian. But they spoke Sicilian always, 
and they all did. And like, so it kind of sucked because I was stupid. I should have learned the language. And I might say, what did he say? And I remember, I like, what did that mean? And I go to ask my Uncle Sal. So Uncle Pete just said this, da, 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 da. what does that mean? You tell me what it means. And I go, okay. Sometimes I remember, sometimes I don't. But I heard the, the normal like saying, like, ah, ma signori, go per esale, pazzo, it was me, it was crazy, you know, things like that. But uh, I didn't, uh, I wish I would have learned it. So my my mother, I think, moved us out of my grandparents' house because we were just too much, you know. I think it was, it was my grandfather was a few times kind of snappy on me. Um, and mean to me, but he didn't, not bad, but you know, he wasn't his normal self. You know, I've been living with them for, for, for five, six years, you know, they did, you know, they wanted to retire and just sit back, watch freaking Westerns and, and, and just, you know, watch, watch football. I love football. That was the thing. He want to sit down and watch football. And he was a handicapper. So he'd do like, like Larry Mazza, he'd handicap all the teams. He had the newspapers out there. And when he was doing the sports thing, his book, he had four phones going and he would just get calls from people who were had you know, off bounce books. And he'd call a guy, can you handle this weight or no, or no, no, no. Click, 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 click. And until he had it balanced, kick off, boom, whatever he gets paid. Um, I remember telling Scott Bernstein about it. I said, trying to say, you understand how that works? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, That's what he did. Oh, I know, I know. Like, uh-huh. Yeah, you sure you do, pal. <laughs> but, um, so my mom moved us out. We went and got a house in, in Harrison Township. Um, a little shack ass house. Uh, my mother tried to work as a, um, as a, a school teacher, but she ended up having a nervous breakdown, which is a mental disability she had a nervous breakdown she flipped out they put her on a bunch of medic medication that made her zombie and sleep all day she didn't clean she didn't do nothing man she just laid there got fat fat as hell and just laid around slept all day long and i uh, wouldn't cook clean do nothing the house was trash and we lived in this tiny little shack of a little uh, like it was a house divided into three units right and all it was was like uh two bedrooms like a, a fa like a one room living room and then attached to a small shitty little kitchen it was so small and crappy everything was crappy everything and then and then my mom didn't clean so it just got disgusting and my room was trash and uh we live but my my grandparents didn't know like my mother hid it from them really well uh she made them believe that she was working when she wasn't we were on welfare so we'd starve when the when the when the we, we ate you know the welfare focus hope cheese um, the crackers and stuff. We, every freaking month, man, she, we'd go to the freaking welfare station and she'd grab the cheese and the crackers and the powdered milk and we'd have to use it. She would get enough food, get the food stamps, right? And boom, we, we'd have enough food and eat good for like two weeks. But then the food was gone in two weeks and then um, we'd starve. So it, it was it was sad because I'd have to, I'd go eat at my friend's house all the time. I remember like just going to my friend's house to have a sandwich just a sandwich while they were eating. I'm like, can I have a sandwich too? And they're like, yeah, sure. And I was like, oh, thank you, thank you. I was a fast metallic little kid, you know, and I ran around like a little rug rat. Those, those, I did a show called The Wonder Years, and I should do that. I should tell you about that again. But it, it really was a happy time in my life, even though my mother was mentally ill and sick. Um, I did, I enjoyed that, that neighborhood because it was across the street from the lake, and a couple of my friends lived on the lake. And we could go fishing every day. And plus there was this big wooded wood lot. We called it Lake Lot. It was about three acres on the on the lake. Somebody owned it, but we used it like we owned it. We put a bike racetrack in there, a bunch of forts. It was right on the lake, man. We were hunting ducks with our BB guns. I mean, it was just like Huck Finn. And now that my friend, my friend's house was next door to it. So we would literally like, it was ours. And then they had this big freaking point that went out into the lake, like 200 yards and all these big giant willow trees. And at the end of the point, there was a duck blind. Um, so we could go duck hunting with shotguns. But I mean, it was set off the road, like freaking, you know, 400 yards. So, I mean, we duck, everybody duck hunted along the lake there, you, you know, all the time. Everybody had a line. Just about every freaking buddy on the lake had a blind right there on their, on their dock, in the back of the house. We ran around with BB guns, shooting squirrels and freaking shooting rabbits. We had traps. We trapped stuff, man. I trapped rabbits. And just, we did, we just had fun, man. Fishing and hunting with our BB guns and playing. My friend had a little boat, aluminum boat. Um, and we'd go fishing in it every day. My other friend, Carl, who lived on the lake, his dad was a surgeon. They had a big house. No, excuse me. His dad was an anesthesiologist and he was older than me. He was like 16. I was only like 12. Um, he, he had a, uh, he had a bigger boat, uh, not much bigger, but he had a bigger motor on it and we could go water skiing behind it. It was just a little outboard motor with 25 horsepower outboard motor. 
uh, in like a 16 foot aluminum boat. The dude, it would pull us up right on the water skis. And I learned how to water ski and I could do, I, I was trick skiing. I was doing tricks. I do 360s, go sideways, backwards. I mean, it was nothing real crazy, but I was 12 years old. So, you know, it felt like it was, I was doing pretty good. But, um, and that's what we did. And I love those years, my wonder years where I kind of lived a normal life. I had a couple of good friends. It was a tight niche little freaking like neighborhood. My friend Johnny, he R.I.P. He died. Um, the Colts brothers, Jeff, Carl, Tim, uh, the girls across the street from me, uh, Lisa and, and Kim. One of them just recently messaged me. Lisa did, which was interesting. And um, and then there was Carl, and then there was a dude named Mike, then there was uh, Brad, and um, and then there were some people. I there's all over there were people around the neighborhood. There's these two kind of ghettoy streets over there where like these crappy cheap houses, like trailer trash girls lived, and they were mean to my sister. So I I bossed up on them one time. I said stop me being mean to my sister. But, um, and then we just had a good time there. And then I, uh, my mother went into another nervous breakdown. And, um, so, so I'm telling you all this because I, I want you to, I want to give you an idea of the evolution of my life and how I ended up where I ended up, you know, prison and, and kind of got here. You would think, I mean, I, I was talking to Ron Asante and as I tell him my story, he's like, you know, I'm not saying you're normal, he said, but all things considered, you're pretty like st stable. I'm like, eh, you don't know me that well. <laughs> He's like laughing. It's like, no. He's like, I, I mean, all things considered, you you're pretty mentally stable. Considering your mom was mentally ill and all the stuff you've been through and everything you overcome, you know, the prison and all that. I said, yeah. I mean, God by the grace of God, you know, I um, I held it together, and so. Uh, so I get in a fight. I, I, I'm always fighting. I'm, I'm just always, I'm a troubled kid, man. I'm dirty. I don't have nice clothes. I'm skinny. I need a haircut. I probably stink. I probably haven't taken a bath once a freaking week. Oh, my shoes are old and gross. I'm disgusting. And I know people think it. And I can't do nothing about it. I don't have no freaking money. My mom would take us to my grandparents every weekend. We would drive from Harrison Township to my grandparents' house in Gross Point. They were still living in Gross Point. They would later move to the St. Clair Shores, like five miles away. And I always call it Gross Point. I always say, I still live with them in Gross Point when I lived later. But it wasn't. They moved to St. Clair Shores. But I just naturally say Gross Point is basically the same freaking city. They border each other and they moved like five miles from where they live, literally. Um, so, but they still living in Gross Point at the time. So we drive down Jefferson. My mom didn't like to drive on the expressway. So we take the long route all the way to freaking down Jefferson, the, the scenic route, past the millionaire, past Billionaire's Row. <clears throat> no joke. Billionaire's Row is Jefferson or Lakeshore Drive in Gross Point. As you're driving down, the lake is on this side and there are freaking $20 million house after $20 million. I, mean, I don't know what they, how much they really are, but I mean, if they were in Beverly Hills, they'd be $100 million houses. So just to give you an idea, they were huge. Like we're talking 6,500, 8,000 square foot houses, huge, one after another, after another, after another, after another for like four miles. It's crazy. Um, and some of them on this side that are actually on the lake, you can't even see them. There's just a gate. And you get a glimpse of them back then. Art Van's house back there is a castle. He's all, this is where, William, uh, this is where uh, the Ford Mansion is back there. So we drive to my, my grandparents' house, and here's what would happen. My mom would bring all the laundry, so we'd do all the laundry. My We'd spend the whole weekend there, and I loved it. I loved it. I'd bring my bike. I'd throw my bike in the trunk. I was like, hell yeah. I'd pull my bike out. I'm gone. I'd eat a nice meal at my grandparents' house. There's always tons of food. Anything I wanted. Grandma, can I have a sandwich? Can I have some pasta? Can I have everything? Sugu? Anything I want. They'd make it. Cookies. If I want cookies, done. Made. Everything. The women are just bang, bang, bang. They'd make it. No problem. Don't even question it. So I'd eat. And then I'd jump on my bike. I had this Schwinn Predator. I'm gone. I'm going to find Frankie. I'm going to find Johnny. I'm going to find Eric. I'm going to find some of my friends. I'm gone. And I was run the neighborhood. You know, go up to the freaking the uh, school, Tromley School, and I, you know, do tricks on my bike and freaking hang out with these guys, hit on these girls, blah blah blah, blah just kind of hang out in the neighborhood, my old neighborhood, the neighborhood I grew up in, get in a little trouble, we go knock over some garbage cans or something. But it's just it felt like I was back home where I belong. I felt I felt. That was where that place created the character in me. The the person that I am, even to this day, was created by those five, six years that I spent there in Gross Point. It was a weird amalgamation city. 
on one hand, it was like rich, um, wealthy, and well-to-do people, but there was quite a few like lesser uh, fortunate kids there too that were just they were still better off than middle class, but they were like you know troubled kids, no dad or just whatever it was. So there's some bad kids, and I fit in with them bad kids. So I, I you know hang out with them at the at the school, and um and then there was alleys. There was alleys like like in the hood, but but it wasn't the hood. These were nice clean alleys. And so you could hang out in the alleys. We played we play dice in the alleys. We'd you know, ride our bikes in the alleys. You know, we'd kick garbage cans over in the alleys. The alleys were our escape. If somebody chased us, we'd go flying through the alley, jump the curb. So, I mean, I like being back there. Uh, but my mother, you know, then we'd, we'd stay there all weekend. And then we'd go back to our hovel. For some reason, my grandparents didn't put together two and two that we were freaking dead-ass broke and filthy and living bad. They never came. They never came to our house. Why would they? Why would they come to our little shitty hovel? And, and I think they came there like one time when we first got it. And like, oh, cool. Got a house. Bye. And then, you know, we go to their house. They had this big, beautiful house, tons of food. And they would, she would send us home with a big box of food, big sugu, a gallon of sugu, which is pasta sauce, you know, a bunch of leftovers, bunch of food, whatever, boxes of fruit. My grandpa always had tons of fruit because of his business. And we'd go home and it'd be, it, we'd survive off it for a freaking week, you know? But eventually, because I was such a little scumbag, I was always fighting. And um, maybe people just intrinsically tried to bully me because cause I was dirty. And I was a skinny little dirty kid. My hair was like long and nappy. I was a freaking mess, man. A little buck tooth kid. I, look, I was a freaking mess. So people tried to bully me and I would not stand stand for it. I did not back down from nobody, man. Nobody. I don't care how old they were, how big they were. I had mother up and seniors, like, like high school seniors, like trying to punk me and I'd say, F you, they laugh. Get the frick out of here, kid. They pushed me away. But I wasn't backing up. So I was always getting in fights. So I went to Lance Cruz uh, South Middle School and I remember I, I was, you know, I just, I just told the story about bullies. So I told this, I want to tell the story again, but I remember I got in a fight with a kid. I was helping a kid. His name was David, a big muscle bound, uh, good looking kid who had a, he got hit by a bus or something or I think a truck and he limped really bad. And some older kids were basically beating him up in the bathroom. And I walked in there, like caught him. So I jumped in and started fighting. I was already on suspension, in-house suspension for fighting. So they caught me fighting. And they got in trouble. And then a few weeks later, I got in a fight with this I, this kid, Bill Plunkett, was bullying this ki other kid named Bruce the Moose. And I said, you know, bully me, mother effer, you punk ass mother. He wouldn't do it. And then he jumped on my back when I walked away and I started fighting. I beat his ass right in front of my principal. My principal was walking by when I did it. And that was the last straw. So they tried to call my mom and they can't find my mother. So I can't remember what happened next, but like they either got a hold of my father or my grandparents. I think they got my grandparents on the phone. That was like your emergency contact. And and they said, you know, where's your... Where, they asked us, me and my sister, where's your mother? And we're like, in the hospital? I'm like, how long has she been in the hospital? Like three weeks? She freaked out and the cops came and they took her away. She was like having a breakdown. Crazy. She was nuts, walking around outside barefoot, screaming and yelling. And the cops came and they took her to... They cuffed her up and put her in a freaking paddy wagon and took her to the mental insane asylum and dude I, I had to visit my mother in an insane asylum dude do you know how 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 do you know how hard that is on a child to go to a mother effing insane asylum this is about the time i did it my grandparents took me they're gonna take me to see your mother i remember it was a long ride it was in ypsilanti michigan i remember because they took me there when i got arrested for the cases that sent me to prison one of my defense options, my lawyer said, he wanted me to play crazy. He wanted me to play crazy and say that I had this um, imaginary killer gangster threatening to kill me if I didn't pay him money. And that's why I was acting crazy, like robbing mother efforts. This is the defense, the, the attorney's defense you know, plan. And it didn't work. I, I, I went there and, and I basically went there and just kind of acted myself. I don't know. I, I can't play crazy. I mean, I guess I could play crazy, but then I'd have to stay crazy, you know, for, for the rest of my life. And I just, I knew I wasn't going to pull it off, but I went there into this crazy, insane asylum. 
Um, but I was and I was locked down in a lockdown wing. They chained you and locked you up, and you're in a room. And when I went and visit my mother, she was. Um, I remember it was her birthday. That's why we went there for her birthday. It must have been March because her birthday is March. Um, we brought her a cake. I remember, we didn't have a knife to cut the cake, so my grandpa used the string that was on the box. The box for the cake it was a white vanilla cake with white frosting. And there was a string around the box. So my grandpa opened the box and we were like, we don't have a knife because you can't have a knife in a crazy house, you know, an insane asylum. So I don't even know if we had, they let us have like plastic fork, I'm sure. And so we remember he took the string and like chopped it into pieces like that. And I thought that was pretty ingenious. But um, I remember going in there and they walk us through s several wings, if you will. And there were some, cr this crazy mother efforts in there. I'm talking clucking like a chicken treaking one dude was walking against the wall and just kept walking against it boom 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 just insane and that was what the examples i just give you are like three examples of like hundreds that i saw in there it was freaky it was freaky to f and freak me to f out i'm like 12 years old 13 years old and i'm seeing these insane people and my mother is in here with them and i remember being pissed I remember, like, what the fuck is my mom doing in this place? Because my mom was pretty normal. They had her medicated. And she was fine. She's like, she's like, hi, honey, how you doing? She, she's like, I love you so much. I miss you. And I'm like, yeah, I miss you too, ma. And, uh, and I just couldn't believe my mother was in here with these crazy mother efforts, man. Like, she did. She, I said, mom, why do I have you in here? And she's like, it's not long. I'm gonna be coming home. Like, why are you in here with these people? You're not like these people. She's like, I know. I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with these people? Like, well, how could you put my mother in with these freaking people, man? These insane mother efforts, clucking like chickens and, and barking and crawling around the ground like they're a dog. And and, and I, just, I, didn't, I just couldn't believe it, man. And, uh, and it, it kind of broke my heart. I, I just, you know, you, to see your mother in that situation, dude, it's just, it's horrible. And uh, anyways, so my mother, what happens is I end up going to have to live with my father, my drunk, alcoholic father. Um, I'm going to leave it on that. It's an hour. My mother would get out of the insane asylum several months later or, not, you know, not that even long. I think it was just a month or two. It might have been a couple months. Um, and then she moved in with her parents, back with my grandparents. But I couldn't go, I, like, they didn't want me and my sister, you know, and at that point, um, so it was around, it was around that time that they moved into the St. Clair Shores house, so I was like, right about that time, I don't know, they might have been in Gross Point for another year or two, you know, my mom ended up staying with them for the next, well, the rest of her life, until, well, towards the end, she got her, before my mother died, she was 44 years old, she did, um, have an apartment, and I can't even think about it one time, but I'll tell you the story. I want you to know how, how fucked up my heart is. I was at Kite Monroe. My mother lived in an apartment by herself about two miles away. My mother called me every day about five times. Five times a day. Drive me nuts. Mom, mom, what? Mom, what? And she'd answer me, honey, how you doing? She just wants to talk. My mother just wants to hear my voice. I love you. I miss you. Mom, she lives by herself. She just wants to talk to her son, her baby boy. I hang up, Mom, stop calling. So I go to this Kite Monroe, this softball diamond or baseball diamond. My boy Gino's playing baseball. I'm sitting there watching the game. I look over. I see my mother walking. She's walking out of the, the ballpark. And I don't go say nothing to her. I don't even go say hi. Yeah, and she died a couple weeks later. I don't know why I didn't go say hi. My own mother. She's walking two miles home. Just, I don't know why she was there just to watch some baseball, I guess. My mother. Couldn't miss her. She was a big heavyset woman. She's walking. Why didn't I run down there and say, Ma, what are you doing? And give her a hug and a kiss. It would have made her day. It would have made her life. She would have made her freaking week. She would have freaking, she probably would have cried. She would have been so happy. No. I don't know. It's, it's what it is. Can't can't go back in time. 
I'll get to that, uh, what happened to my mother in the next one. But basically, I, I ended up going to move with my drunk, uh, alcoholic, douchebag father who wouldn't even buy me food. So continue, please continue. I'll do another video, start off there and tell you about the next leg of my journey into freaking, you know, dark doom. <laughs> Ultimately, I win. So just so you know, it might get bad, but um, I'll make a comeback. Here I am. So God bless.